justice! It's really a classic example of how the police will demonize their victims and create a whole new scenario to try and protect the thin blue line and their officers. My nephew is Marcus Golden. He was killed by two St. Paul police officers, Jeremy Dover Spike and Dan Peck. One of the officers slipped on ice and his gun went off. The other began to shoot, thinking his partner had been shot. The police told many lies and changed the audio accounts of the incident. The representative speaking for the St. Paul Police giving the press conference was Paul Paulos. What he said was that my nephew Marcus tried to run over both of the officers. Then they later changed the account that he tried to run over one of the officers. And that's just a, one of the many, many lies and um, fabrications. But what we found out from a witness is that yeah, the officer did slip on ice. Marcus was shot in the back of the head and the back of his arm, and his vehicle was completely shot up. He was behind an apartment building. It was isolated. It was dark. It's a dead end. The officers told the paramedics to park on the street. He was behind the building. It was up a hill. They also said, send one medic. As friends of ours, we were listening to the radio accounts we were talking about them, then we saw that they had changed, they had been deleted and re-recorded. My nephew was killed across the street from St. Paul Region's Trauma Center. He was never taken to the hospital. Having the paramedics park on the street in the winter, they said send one medic, which paramedics work in twos because they have to carry equipment as well as push the gurney. That meant one paramedic going up an icy hill, a long icy hill, and go about half a block or so to where my nephew was. That also delayed any type of medical attention he would have received. My nephew was unarmed for 11 hours until Officer Sheila Lambie of the St. Paul Police Department came to my parents' home and retrieved a gun he legally owned. In the midst of all the inconsistencies, what they said was, there was some trash on the bottom of the passenger side of the floor, which is why it took them so long to find the gun. 11 hours to find a gun on the floor of a passenger seat. So that's a bit of what happened um, in my nephew's case. The man that was killed last Wednesday was my brother Marcus. He was a good man. He was there for me every time when I needed him. And I'm, right now, I'm currently going to school for law enforcement to work with the police. And it hurts just because this is the city that I want to work for. And now that this happened, it's hard. It's hard for me. My sister, Marcus's mother, she was a volunteer officer with the St. Paul Police Department for 22 years, and she was a reserve sergeant for seven of those years. So she knew the police chief, Chief Smith, um, quite well, and they lied on her in the report. Three of them got together and said that my sister told them Marcus always wanted to kill a cop. They just wrote lies. And what happens when the police write lies in their reports, it makes it difficult for the families to f secure help in terms of getting some type of justice because it's very difficult to prove in, in a court case because people believe the police in what they're saying. There's a day where we won't march no more And while my sister ain't equal And my brothers can't breathe Marching hand in hand with my family We will feel these streets, come on! So I am Marcus Ryan Kelly Golden's mother And I'm hurt, and I'm torn apart Confused it Just makes everything so difficult my son that spoke earlier, I'm so proud of him for still wanting to continue on with law enforcement. He's almost done. My older son, one of his degrees was in criminal justice. And my affiliation for the last 20 years with the St. Paul Police Department. My son Marcus, beautiful, handsome, tall, strong, 
soft-spoken, good-hearted. This is a testament to why we cannot push community relations with the police. We cannot push trusting the police. We so often hear about we need to build trust. We cannot trust the police because when they know someone, what they do is they take information to use against them. That's the purpose that the police have of trying to know who is in the community and what they're doing. They just want to get information or extract information from you to harm somebody else. People have been so trained to believe that the police are actually here to protect and serve when that is not true. The police are here to maintain the status quo. The police are here to protect property, to protect the wealthy and corporate interests. And America is a corporation. This is why America is not doing anything at a legislative level nationally to stop police brutality, to stop police executions or otherwise homicides because capitalism needs the police. And as long as America is a capitalist society, money will always be put before people, profits will always be put before the environment and we will continue to struggle and there will continue to be a wealthy upper class that will continue to prosper and there'll be less and less for us, not in terms of less justice only, less provision and less of everything that we need as a greater society to be prosperous. You see our streets! You see our streets! The reason why we're doing this is because you will ignore us if we don't. So there were a lot of uh, protests that surrounded my nephew's execution. Black Lives Matter Minneapolis reached out to my family and we met with them and they dedicated the MLK Reclaim the Day March to my nephew. Uh, there were about 2,000 people that came out. We marched in St. Paul from Snelling University down to the Capitol where they hosted a beautiful candle vigil for my nephew. It was so powerful and so supportive that that really, you know, gave me the strength to like stand up and like, we gotta keep this going. Black Lives Matter St. Paul really gave me some legs to stand on and we could really have some more protests. And the first one we did was we protested at the state fair. We had about 900 people that it was a very powerful action in response because I thought, you know, I would go to the state fair with my nephew pretty much every year. And I thought, what a great place to bring the message that black lives matter to people from you know the five state region and even from people internationally who are coming to the state fair so it was um, a means where we began to really grow and meet people and connect with other people when we continue to come together then with uh, Jamar Clark being killed with Phil Quinn being killed we had a community where we could come together support them. We're doing vigils and protests, shutting things down, disrupting traffic. Uh, continually, we've done a lot here. So since that time, I have been working not only for my nephew, but for other families of stolen lives to help them celebrate the lives of their loved ones, as well as seek justice and keep their names alive in the streets. So the work that I do is to encourage people to help them live and survive through the trauma of the police brutality, the execution, the lies, the media reports that are false, and all the criticisms and the critiques and the things that people will say online, which are very harmful and hurtful as well. So it's really about helping people rise above the trauma and really to be able to maneuver and survive in a new way of life, knowing that their loved ones are not forgotten, that there is a community of people that is able and willing to support them and help them. A major component that would change the deadly use of force by police is holding police accountable. Once police understand that, yes, if you do this, there's a, you will go to prison, then that will stop right there. If police know that they're not going to have the support of their brothers in blue, then that will also help. If they know that they will not be allowed to sit on paid leave for two years, as we've seen here, if they know that they can no longer work for another police department, that their police career is over after they wrongfully kill someone, then that will change things also. When police begin to understand that they'll be held accountable for their actions, then that will change it. But without accountability, there will be no change. 
And aside from accountability, officers should give a statement immediately after they've killed someone. A video recorded, legal, sworn statement. They should not have days to collaborate with lawyers and other schemers to try and come up with a story. These are the things that when these things change, we will see officers change how they're doing their work. And anyone who is aware of any wrongdoing from another officer, they should be held accountable as well for not bringing that forward. But what happens now, there's not protection for officers. And we have seen officers, they either lose their job, they've even been killed. So the officers who break that blue line, they need protection from their own because they're killers and they're deadly. And they will turn their back on their fellow officers just like they turned their back on my sister, and for them it can be deadly. And I just want the state of Minnesota, the whole nation to know that my son, I want everyone to remember him for the good person that he was in the short time of only 24 years. Please remember my son was a good hearted person, a caring, a loving, human being. He was he's so beautiful. So beautiful.